Welcome to Side Alpha Leadership, a podcast where leaders can share their experiences and discuss what leadership means to them. I'm your host, David Polikoff. Hello and welcome to this month's edition of Side Alpha Leadership. I'm your host, David Polikoff. Uh, on the phone today, uh, I have the pleasure of talking with Steve Hamilton. Uh, I've known Steve for about three or four years. Um, we uh, ran in the same circles, knew the same people at uh, Fire Engineering. We met at FDIC. Um, and uh, he teaches a really good class about uh, police and, and fire uh, together. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the police and fire commingling on uh, on certain uh, incidents, and uh, and then wherever the conversation takes us. So without going any further, Steve, welcome to the show. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Vice President Polakoff. <laughs> uh, I, I think I'll always end up referring to you that in some way, shape, or form. Um, well, now, n- n- now we're going to have to go into that, how that actually yeah. occurred after your introduction. You tell everybody a little bit about yourself. <laughs> right. Um, so, as you said, I'm Steve Hamilton. Um, I am a captain with the Fort Jackson Fire Department here in Columbia, South Carolina, Yes, I work for the Department of Army as a civilian firefighter. I've been selected for assistant chief, uh, which will be the assistant chief of professional services, under which we'll have a training bureau and a codes prevention bureau. It's a it's a new thing that we are looking to do. But the onboarding process for a promotion can can take many layers, and I'm going through those layers as we speak. So. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm being called chief and in some circles I'm being called captain and that's perfectly fine. Um, I've been in the fire service since 1996. I started off as a volunteer in upstate New York, joined the air force, spent four years active duty, uh, as a fire protection specialist, which is a fancy way of saying firefighter. When I got out of the air force, I shotgunned my resume out wherever there were openings and Fort Jackson answered first, offered me a, a position as a tailboard firefighter. And I've been here since 2002. Um, in 2010, I made my father's uh, nightmare a reality and became a reserve deputy with the Richland County Sheriff's Department. Um, if you've ever watched live PD, Richland County, we're on live PD, uh, quite frequently, which is now live patrol, I believe is what they, what they refer to it as on the, on the real channel, the, uh, Danny Brown, um, probably the biggest well-known face on that, uh, program. That's, uh, that's the department that I work for, um. In January of this year, I retired from the sheriff's department. Sheriff Watt has a policy that after 10 years of service as a reserve, and likely in other capacities that I can't articulate what the policy is, he allows you to retire if you so choose to. I retired. I get a set of retirement credentials. And I have that HR 214 benefit for the rest of my life, uh, which is a good perk to have. Um, I come from a, a family of servitude and public service. My brother is a firefighter in upstate New York on a career job at the moment. My father was in law enforcement for 36 years. Uh, attaining the rank of senior investigator in a uh, criminal investigation unit. My uncle was a sheriff's deputy corrections officer on Long Island. My grandfather was in the same department, also as a CO on Long Island. So we've had uh, a mix of all of that. My uh, mother's side of the family, as well as my father's side of the family, 
has a litany of volunteer firefighters uh, all on Long Island. So that's, uh, that is where I came from. And I've been teaching at FDIC ooh, a little over 10 years now, I guess. And my topic that I speak on is violent scene response for fire and EMS, active shooter, terrorism, things like that. Um, I've been a committee member with NFPA 3000, the active shooter hostile event uh, response program since 2018. Um, and our, we just finished up a couple of months ago, we just finished up our read through of public comments and drafting the next iteration of the standard. So um, I have a vast background of stuff not really understanding or knowing what I want to be when I grow up, but that's, that's me in a nutshell, so to speak. The, uh, and, and, you know, unfortunately in today's world, we're seeing a lot of mass shootings and things like that happening. And, and, um, I know that, uh, it is a large call out for police and fire, um, when I worked in Montgomery County, uh, when I was a captain assigned to uh, Rockville Station Number Twenty Three, the uh, operations chief at the time, he's now currently the fire chief. He's getting ready to retire from Montgomery. He had called me up out of the blue and and said that, uh, you know, he said, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm thinking about putting a uh, a, um, a group of people together from a specific t- station that would, you know, uh, be embedded with the police." Uh, to handle, to be there for them when they have their call-outs. They call me EST call-outs. Uh, it's like SWAT call-outs. Um, and in there, uh, that specialized team was uh, the county police department, the county sheriff's department, and uh, there were some other uh, municipal police departments that were in Montgomery County where they had people that were all part of that. So he wanted to, he had already talked to the police chief, ran the idea by him. They thought it was a good idea and uh, they picked my station because we had engine, medic unit, ambulance, and a tower. So we had everything there and we started the training right away. Um, it was, you know, I don't know what transpired on, on his side um, about how that came about. He, uh, that uh, at the time, the, the de- operations chief, he had always had his foot in special operations for the fire service when it came to USAR and uh, trench collapse and high angle and stuff like that. So it was just another shoot off of, uh, of the uh, special operations part of the, uh, of the fire service. So I was very proud and happy to be in that. It was kind of cool and brought it back to my shift. And of course, the first thing they said is, are they going to give us guns? He said, no, you're not going to have guns. Um, but that eventually did uh, transfer into making really good relationships with the police departments where they or with the uh, with the uh, EST guys. Good relationships led into the trust. Um, ultimately, we ended up getting um, um, <clears throat> bulletproof vests uh, for uh, the team, which went to all the battalion chiefs would actually carry vests for the fire and rescue personnel when they did get the call out. So they would have that stuff. So it it did uh, transform into something. But um, before we start to talk about, you know, how, uh, what is the mechanics of getting something like that together for people that are listening to it, that they think that, you know, there is a world where the two entities need to be together. Let's talk about the whole vice president of, um, it's not vice president of the United States. I was introduced to you as the vice president of Clarion, which had just bought out uh, Penwell Fire Engineering and whatnot. And um, I think uh, uh, our our mutual friend, Frank Ritchie, who's been on the show many a times, um, had snuck me into the author's dinner. Now, I haven't written anything other than a couple of chapters for some books, a couple of articles, but I have not written books like uh, Frank has now and Dave McGlynn has now um, and you had your DVD series and then all the other authors that people have read throughout their career uh, I'm standing in there and Frank thought it would be funny to uh, kind of prank everybody in the room because Clarion was so new they didn't know who anybody was and uh, you were part of that so I'll let you tell the tale yeah that was uh, that was a good time um uh-huh. Yeah, so Frank's like, yeah, 
I want I want to introduce you to the vice president of, of Clarion. And I was like, okay. And I thought for a minute, you know, picking Frank as the ambassador to take the vice president of Clarion out on the town during FDIC might not be the best decision. Um, Frank, Frank has this like energizer bunny battery system that I haven't quite really understood. Um, Frank can actually absolutely run with the wolves and rise with the roosters it's better than anybody I know. That's a fact. Uh, that is a fact. Yeah, that is a fact. Uh, without, without being inappropriate or immature or, or egregiously intoxicated in that process, it's, it's, it's pretty much an amazing thing. Um, but yeah, he introduced you as the vice president of, of Clarion. I was like, okay. Like, hi, nice to meet you. And uh, we took the author's dinner to another another place, a place I'd never been to. I think it was Slippery Noodle. I'm not really sure. Yeah, that was um, that, that was afterwards. It, it was a Slippery Noodle. It was something that had a second floor. Yes. Um, and and I have not been back to that particular to that particular venue since then. Um. But while we were, while we were all hanging out, I'm I'm a pretty personable individual. I chat up people. I started to to chat up the vice president of Clarion. To which, at this point, I think everybody was hip to the fact that you were not the vice president of Clarion, except for me. Um, so they they kind of let that one roll. Um. The, the good part was when you were like, yeah, I, you know, I just came back from Comic-Con. So I was like, okay. And I didn't know what the hell Comic-Con was. Um, and today I have a very loose understanding what Comic-Con is, <laughs> but apparently it's, it's, it's rather large. Um, but I was like, yeah, you know, you guys have, have definitely invested in a premier conference. Um, we are very, tight knit community within fire and EMS. And this is, this is our, this is our safe place for, for conferences. And you, you're in a good investment and I can't, I don't know if we left the slippery noodle and then it was related. Hey, this is Dave Polikoff. And I was like, okay, the vice president of Clarion's name is Dave Polikoff. I'm like, no, um, he, he's not the vice president of Clarion. I'm like, uh, okay. Or if it was the next day, it, 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 it went on for a good, for a good minute. Yeah. I, th- and, I think it was like the next day. Cause I finally had told Frank, I felt bad. I'm like, do we need to let him off the hook? <laughs> because I'm starting to feel kind of bad. Cause I don't know the guy, but I know he's a cop. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I I love uh, my version's not sexy. No, Dave McGlynn, when he <laughs> yeah, it, it's sexier. Well, because he's, he's like, animated yeah. with the New York, the, the New Jersey thing, yeah. and hands yeah, going all over the place. <laughs> yeah, so like Hamilton, he's like falling all over this guy. He's like yo hey oh hey oh hey oh, and I'm like, that's that's not really how I recollect it, Dave. Um. <laughs> So it's a sexier version, but the cat was let out of the bag. And I remember looking over at Frankie going, you son of a bitch. And me being done with it, I put it, put it away and never, never put another thought to it. And for every FDIC thereafter, <laughs> right, um, it, it so comes up. <laughs> someone tells the story and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to refer to you as the VP and we're just going to, just what it's going to be right so, the, cool, the cool thing is you still want to hang out we still have a good time so but that's we, everybody that listens to the podcast you know that's what firemen do we bust balls and uh you know it, it, it was uh it'll forever be the story and like i said it, it wasn't as dramatic as mcglenn will make it sound but uh you know that's the whole jersey thing going on <clears throat> well yeah. and, and and here's the thing had it not had we 
not been a circle of ball busting firemen. I probably wouldn't want to hang out with you. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, these people are stuffy. Um, and that and my New York roots, I'm waiting for the opportunity to create the circumstance where the next story is way better and I'm the author of it. So I'm biding my time. Yep. You have plenty of time that's, to plan. That's, that's what every firefighter does that gets punked. They're just biding their time. Everybody's got a story of getting punked and their flip where they punk somebody back is usually epically better. That's right. Yeah, I'm sure. But you're I, safe. Uh, yeah. You're I, safe. I, I, I'm sure that, uh, that it'll be on Dave and, uh, It'll be funny. And, well, it's going to be on Frank. Yeah, He's got a whole other thing. Right. Um, and I deserved it because I don't think it might have been that year. It might have been a year before that, but I, brank, I broke Frank's shoelace. So I if think, you ever spent. I think that was the year before because I kind of vaguely remember that story. Yeah. All right. Basically, that little bottom, the last shoelace in your in your shoe right <laughs> down at the bottom by your toes you grab it and pull it and it makes this giant loop and your shoe's super tight and you got to untie and 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 loosen them all and get the thing back centered the way it's supposed to be yeah i i tried to do that with a pair of his dress shoes and i actually i mean since it's you know high dollar frank reachy stuff it was like leather and it snapped <laughs> so he walked around for the rest of the evening with a loose shoe with broken shoelaces <laughs> um, but I went to the mall the next day and I got, I got him new shoelaces and I replaced it and all, all should have been well, but no, right. he nope. came up with the vice president. <laughs> let's punk Hamilton moment. That's fine. It's all good. It'll, it'll, it comes in full circle. So now that we've got that out of the way, people understand the inside joke and, and, uh, and from here on out. But, uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the fire police, the role that, uh, the fire service can play on these call-outs that have the potential, you know, obviously very dangerous w- w- when it's an active shooting situation, how that translates very quickly or transfers very quickly into a mass casualty incident and the role that the fire department will play. But first and foremost, how does that relationship start? How does uh, one approach the other to say, Here's, you know, what we bring to the table when it comes to uh, an active shooter, a mass casualty incident on the fire side. Where is there room for us on the police side to be there for you guys in case something happens? And then when it does transition over to a mass casualty, once you've got the the area, the warm zone established, um, how do we make that relationship work? What what? What needs to happen so we can start to foster those lines of communications and eventually move into the actual meet and greet and then the, the training? Well, so it, it, it might seem simple in concept. And the reality is it takes, it takes a deep intellectual mind to see the simple, you know, Thomas Edison came up with like 200 different iterations of the light bulb before he got it right. So it's difficult to see the simple, but it's simple. And the way that I try to relate it to the fire fire side of things is do we train to fight a four alarm? Oh my God. Biggest building or structure within your footprint 20 story high rise, whatever that, whatever that looks like type of fire. If we haven't trained on a residential house fire on a 2,500 square foot, three bedroom residential house fire. And for, for this circumstance, it's similar. The active shooter is the four alarm. Oh my God. 20 story building fire on the 15th floor running sprinkler system broke stand pipes broke that's what this is so the 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 first question i would ask to the question is where are you at with your with your law enforcement 
relationship, your your integration to everyday calls for service in which fire law enforcement and or EMS may be expected to work with some type of interoperability. Um, the first being car X. Car X is, is, is likely to be universal across uh, most jurisdictions. How is your relationship with the law enforcement entities that you engage with on car wrecks? If you guys are fighting each other over whether you're going to shut down one lane, two lanes, the entire thing, you need to hurry up and open it, um, et cetera, if, if, if you can't come together at an incident scene, have a conversation and articulate the needs of your agency and their support and vice versa, if you're not doing that well, you're destined to have a disaster when when the incident is a high stakes incident such as uh, a mass shooting um, an active shooter something along the lines that fire is a weapon something where task tactic and strategical objectives assignments or functions by fire and law enforcement requires integration at all three levels you're it's going to be disastrous so identifying where you're at with that. And some, some departments are vastly beyond that. Some of them have, have a mastery of the integration piece so much to the point that they have was well, you had, had articulated when you were back in um, Montgomery County, I believe you said, um, where you had a station identified as as a station that's going to, that's going to potentially integrate with law enforcement. There are, there are departments that have that deep integration to the point where they are literally right behind the first wave that's going into a hot zone and they're immediately coming in the door behind them or coming into the environment behind them and operating in that world, whether that be, whether you want to say that's a hot zone or a warm zone or right along the edge, it's pretty freaking close. There, there are agencies that are doing that right now and they are doing it seamlessly. And then there are some that have no idea what the names of any of the police are in their jurisdiction. So start with that. Um, start with trying to, ensure that you have good, clear communication with one another, um, that you have the ability to express a voice for your objectives, that you are heard if you're in the position where, where you ought to make those types of statements. You have that authority within your organization. Do you, do you have the ability to communicate with law enforcement at an emergency scene? They will stop, listen to you, take in what you have to say, and work together to accomplish their objective, your objective, and mitigate the emergency. If you don't have that, um, you got you got some work to do. I, I, uh, I, I you, you touched on a bunch of, of key things, and, and one of the things that I want to stress uh, to the people that are listening is, you know, it, it's all about building relationships. You got to start somewhere. Um, my father was a, a police officer for almost 30 years. He retired as a police officer, but he was also volunteer fire chief. He was in the fire department. I'm third generation, my grandfather and my father. So I know both worlds. <clears throat> I know the fire service a lot better than the police world. But uh, I always went out of my way to build relationships with the police officers. Um, their job's stressful. I get that. So is ours. But not maybe not what, they, what they're facing on a day-to-day uh, thing. But it's the little things. I remember um, as a battalion chief, uh, you know, I'd come into uh, my station. And I may have three or four police officers in their vehicles, you know, ready, just taking care of some reports or whatever, just waiting for that shift change. And they'd be in their cars. And I would always go up to them, you know, obviously <laughs> – now, I wouldn't run up to them, but, you know, go up to them and get their attention and get them to roll down their window and say, why don't you guys come inside? You know, we get fresh coffee, come sit at the table, we can bring your, you, you know, your, your laptops and 
could do everything in a nice, comfortable environment with light and all that stuff. Some took us up on it, some didn't. Um, it's ironic because literally today, uh, coming home from work, I stopped by my volunteer house. There was a state police officer in our parking lot out front, and he was going over some paperwork. I said, hey, man, why don't you come inside? Uh, you know, uh, you come sit at the table, have a cup of coffee. I said, I know Panera was here yesterday, so we got donuts. And, uh, you know, <laughs> he was pretty cool about it. And he said, yeah, I might come in in a few minutes. I'm just going to finish up a few things. But it's those little things. That's how you build the relationships, you know. So when you see those same officers on your car accidents, because that's where you're usually seeing the police officers is on those car accidents, um, you've built those relationships. And when you say, hey, I need to shut the road down a little bit, it kind of take that. I know this guy. He's pretty cool. Um, he's got a good head on his shoulders. The egos start to kind of melt away a little bit. I've also been involved where I had one of my chief officers when I was a, a younger volunteer uh, wanted to shut down uh, Interstate 95 one lane so he could bring the rescue squad over. And he and the state police officer kind of went back and forth and. The person with the most toys on their belt won, and uh, that was a state police officer. He arrested my deputy chief, literally put him in handcuffs while we were trying to cut a guy out of a car, bring the rescue squad, medic unit over, fly him out, handcuffed him, put him in the back of the car. So, I mean, we've seen that before. So that's one extreme to the other. So I think it's important to start building those relationships with the beat cops, with the cops that are patrolling the area. Some of those guys might be part of that call-out team and, and uh, that familiarity, that that uh, building that rapport, I think, like you said, it goes a long way. That, that's got to be the starting point. And then, you know, once you kind of get everybody in the same room and the chief of the department for the police and then the chief of the department for the fire department kind of get together and then they're going to go over and say, here's what our image is of where this is going to go. Once we get together, what should both entities start focusing on, you know, starting from the ground up? What, what would you say we should focus on as we start to mold the training and how we can get familiar with each other? Well, like you said, if you, uh, you have to formulate the relationship and, and the focus ought to be knowing one another. Um, you should know the names of the people that you work with or that you, that, that work within your jurisdiction. Um, and it should be your counterpart at, at a minimum. So if you're a company officer, you ought to know the corporal sergeant, et cetera, within, within the jurisdiction that you, that you work in. If you're the battalion chief, you ought to know the Lieutenant, the captain, whoever's over the region or the, the district or the zone of, of, of your area. Um, and a handshake and a smile goes a long way. It's, it's all it takes is a handshake and a smile, and you can, you can start that process. If you're not familiar with one another by name, that's the, that's the first thing you ought to try to conquer. You can do that in the training environment. It's going to be a slower process. Um, there's not a fire station in America that I've ever heard of or been to that does not have a kitchen and does not have firefighters that cook at some point, even volunteers. You, you cook at some point. Invite the cops that are on duty to the station when you're having a meal, whether that be a career shift meal, whether that be a volunteer barbecue, whatever the circumstances, invite them to come sit down and have a meal with you at the table. We solve all the world's problems at a firehouse kitchen table. Could you imagine if long. we if we added beer? Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, depending on which department we're talking, Long Island, I'm just yeah. going to say, I mean, it's just, there's, ups- there's a couple of... <laughs> all the upstate of, New York stuff. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of spots. Um, <laughs> the So, it's like the Nextel commercial, the old Nextel commercial where... If firemen were in charge, right? Hey, we want clean water. Yeah, we want clean water. Done. It's it, it's like that. That's the kitchen table, right? Um, in, invite them over for 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 your wagon, whatever you're doing. Um, it's up to you. I wouldn't let them pay if it was me. Um, pass the hat, add sure. a couple plates, whatever the circumstance needs to be. The cordial thing. The cordial thing to do is if you invite someone to your firehouse 
you don't make them pay. <laughs> yeah, there's there's an etiquette thing there. Absolutely. Um, the as you said, it, and what you guys were doing, which is awesome. Your station ought to be a safe place for the cops. It ought to be a safe place for them to not be a cop, where you guys can 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 bullshit back and forth and and no one's worried about body cameras and what you say and um it's got to be a a place where they can run to go to the bathroom um not for nothing if you think about it for just a minute the gun belt i mean state troopers are probably no well known for this you ever see a state trooper they look pristine like they look like they have cardboard under their shirt if you knew the accoutrements that were necessary in order to make that image a reality, and then you get hit with a need to sit down to go to the bathroom, that's an extraordinarily rough thing to do at the gas station. No, no doubt. And, and, and I know our state troopers in Maryland, they, they come out of the vehicle immediately, boop, hat goes on. I'm sure it has a better name than hat, but it's on, and those guys, you know— they looked apart, the and if you tell them, it's like, wow, it must be tough being a police officer. They'll tell you right away, I'm not a police officer. I'm a trooper. I'm a trooper. Absolutely. I'm a trooper. So anybody yeah. out there that wants to be a state trooper, and you go for your interview, and the first question they ask you is, why do you want to be a police officer? The correct answer is, I don't want to be a police officer. I want to be a state trooper. Word. First answer. Uh, <laughs> or same thing with a sheriff's deputy. I'm not a police officer. I'm a, I'm a sheriff's deputy. That's right. What's the difference? One has a union, and... The other works at the behest of the sheriff, and when he says, "Yeah, you don't work here anymore," you don't. Right. Uh, but that creating that safe place for them to come and, as you said, get a cup of coffee, um, a little more controversial, maybe a place to run radar out on the front pad. You you want that presence there. You want the community to see that integration. And, and you want to be able to have that type of relationship. It's, it's important. It allows for the next thing to, to come together, which is exactly what you, what you said. Once you develop that relationship, cop size people up in about three minutes. Within three minutes of, of initiating a conversation with somebody, I either like them or I don't. There's, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of gray. It's, yeah, I like you. It's it, uh, we can talk. We can we can shoot the shit, and or you're a jackass, and I don't want to be around you. Um, Obviously, it's, it's I passed the test, even though being the vice president or not, we still go out and right. have a drink and smoke a cigar, have dinner, and still laugh. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. You're you're safe to drink Irish whiskey with, and that's that's saying a lot. Right. Um, so, it, be being in that, going for that is what is what the goal should be after you've, you've been able to establish that relationship piece where I've smelled your tail. You've smelled my tail. You know, I'm okay. I know you're okay. As you said, when you go out to the incident scene, whatever it may be, whether it be hairy, whether it be complicated, whether it be unique, something that requires thinking and decision-making you are a lot better suited in that moment having that relationship established already or at least the foundation thereof you're a lot better suited to deal with whatever's coming next and and the integration piece than you would be if you didn't um when we did this you know when we took on this venture with montgomery county um you know, at the time, the operations chief said, you know, your point of contact is going to be Sergeant so-and-so from, from the uh, SWAT and uh, got all his information and called him up, really personal guy, and, and we talked. And our, our goal was let's get as much of the team together and I'll get the shift together. I mean, we work three shifts uh, in Montgomery County, so I was on C shift. So uh, my shift got together with their uh, team. They bought out their their Bearcat, and they had a couple of other specialized uh, pieces of, uh, of equipment, rolling equipment, and um, we bought our engine company out in our truck, and we just kind of opened up the compartments and took a look at the tools and what they did. We, they answered questions of stuff that, they, that, that we didn't 
recognize what they had and how to put things together and the same with us and uh what we found is is on their bearcats and on their swat call out vehicle i mean a lot of the tools that they had same tools we have sledgehammers axes halligan bars things like that um ballistic shields uh their formations that they get into how they would uh cover us if we had to grab one of them and pull them out um their equipment, you know, looking at their helmets, their their vests, the things that they wear. So it was more like an open house for the for the two entities and, and uh, answered a lot of questions. And then from there, the next role was, you know, when I talked to the sergeant, I said, you know, <clears throat> tell me some of the things that you see on these call outs that are potential issues and how can we fit in. And the biggest thing they were like, they use, you know, a lot of these uh, call outs start to go towards the fire like they'll light things on fire these barricade situations um obviously if it's an active shooter situation or lighting fires we as firefighters aren't going to be manning the hose line so it was a whole let's teach the let's teach these police officers how to pull a bunch of supply line you know four or five six hundred feet of supply line off the fire engine how to hook it to the hydrant how to pull an attack line how to flank fire and make sure that it's not spreading all while you know, being covered by their fellow officers. So we kind of had to walk them through all that stuff. Um, we would have to pump the fire engine from around a corner where in a safe area so they could man the hose lines. Um, one of the other things they talked about is, is uh, um, they were they were noticing a couple of calls that they had hostage situations where they would throw blankets over them so you couldn't tell how many people were under. You couldn't take a shot. Um, the simple trick, I mean, the easiest thing that uh, they said, yeah, you know, what we want to do is, is uh, you know, set up one of your, your water cannons that you have and just open it up. We'll knock everybody down and then we can go in and, and take care of it. So it's little simple things like that and how the fire department fit into that world. And that started to foster the relationship. And eventually they would have shooting competitions. We would go out there and provide EMS for them. Um, we would look at their weapons that they have they taught us how to make their weapons safe um you know what each weapon was the type of ammunition that it takes things like that so the trust really uh started to build and we're we're talking that this has been in place now in montgomery county for at least 14 years um that they've had that my particular station at the time is still the station so there is a role but like you said that you got to build that relationship. If if you don't know who the officers are, if you don't talk to them on a regular basis, then you're starting at ground at zero at the gr- zero ground, and you got to really work your way up and uh, to the point where you get into how uh, we fit into that world. So once we once you foster that relationship, we recognize each other. We recognize what we each bring to the table. We finally get the call out. How? What do you see the fire service role uh, when it comes to that call out for an active shooter? Uh, the, the police officers have already moved forward with their teams, the long guns, they're covering, they're, they're taking care of uh, room by room, moving forward. They're coming across victims. How soon do you envision fire and rescue being in that position to start pulling people out is it while the shooting is still going on while they're still looking for it as they clear rooms they come across victims what do you see or where do you think that the fire department should be based on what you've experienced and what you've taught about uh in the past well i think um i think it varies greatly by organization um and it's funny because I get uh, pet fire engineering uh, give me a bunch of uh, grief, <laughs> I guess, over the last several years for not writing a book. And I'm like, it is so not cookie cutter when you're trying to articulate response to this these types of incidents. So a lot of it, a lot of it is going to depend on the training knowledge skills of your law enforcement personnel. It is likely, highly likely that the first wave of officers that are going to arrive and engage the threat, likely neutralize the threat are going to be patrol officers. 
they're going to be people in mark cars. It's not going to be, it's not going to be SWAT. It's not going to be SRT. It's not going to be ESU, whatever it happens to be in your, in your area. It is likely not going to be them. They are going to come. They are absolutely going to have a role. You may have, you know, some of them intermixed depending on how that department structures their team. Um, my experience with law enforcement is a lot of the specialized team personnel are actually that role, that function is an extra duty in addition to whatever other roles they perform for the department. So you might have a narcotics officer that is also a, that is also a SWAT or an SRT person. You might have, it might be patrol, it could be investigations, it could be traffic, it could be whatever. So they're going to come from all over the place. But the likelihood that you're going to have a suited and booted team going in to deal with a with a threat um, at an active shooter is, is fairly, fairly limited. So it's going to be based on what's the patrol officer's training, what's their knowledge, skills, and ability. And a lot of departments have embraced that. Um, I think it's fair to say there's not too many law enforcement agencies across the country that don't understand the concept, have not taught or drilled down the fact that you go direct to threat. When you arrive on scene, if you want to wait 30 seconds because you have another officer around in the corner so that you have a two-man team, so be it. That's, that's understandable and acceptable. Um, but if your backup is several minutes away, you're, you're, you're likely going into that environment by yourself. Um, if you have stimuli indication that there's, there has been, um, a shooting, if you don't hear shots, if you're not directed anywhere by bystanders, which is highly unlikely that that wouldn't exist. Um, shell casings, blood, things like that. They're going to go direct the threat. Once they neutralize the threat, where some departments are, are extraordinarily advanced, they train that officer to immediately neutralize the threat. And let's say that that's, let's say that that's ballistically, they, they shoot the suspect, handcuff them, and immediately transition to treating victims. Immediately transition to triage, trying to get a count or at least a sense of how many victims you have, reporting information back by a radio. Where where are your victims? Are they spread out throughout the building? Are they on multiple floors? Are they consolidated in a particular area? Safe routes for fire and EMS, et cetera. Are, are they trained to do that? Are they trained to take a tourniquet, throw it at somebody and say, put that tourniquet on that person's leg or whatever have you? If they are not trained to that level, your integration at the fire and EMS level is going to be hindered, um, likely severely, where you go from what might be your initial arriving company, understanding that the threat has been neutralized, at least a threat has been neutralized, that the point of entry to where the threat was and where you have victims, there's no other apparent threats. You can go in and start treating victims shortly after you pull the parking brake, as opposed to sitting somewhere for 19 minutes, waiting for information to be relayed by law enforcement, a law enforcement team to come and provide security for you. Um, formulating your, your RTF, waiting on ballistic armor, et cetera. Um, all of that is, is, is hinging and dependent upon your training, what you've set in motion ahead of time. Um, the departments, the law enforcement agencies that are being super proactive in training their road officers to all the things that I previously enumerated, you are in a prime position to be able to enter the scene much faster and provide care, 
triage, identifying individuals that need rapid extraction in a, in a lot better circumstance than those that are not. So um, I say all that conglomeration of shit to say that it depends, which is the, the short answer. It depends. Um, outside of all of that, what's the fire department's capability? Do you have ballistic protection? Do you have, you know, tactical emergency casualty care training? Do you carry, do you carry hemostatic dressings? I would say, do you carry tourniquets? But to be honest and fair, the, the, the big push for tourniquets where, hey, the Hartford consensus says we need to get tourniquets. Yep, everybody went out and bought tourniquets. A ridiculous amount of tourniquets. And it doesn't pass the common sense test. If there's a victim in an active shooter environment that requires a tourniquet and the expectation is that fire and EMS are going to apply that tourniquet, that patient is probably dead before you got dispatched. That's, that's not going to save, that's not going to save people. You, you can back up a hasty tourniquet. Um, you can apply a second tourniquet to back up a first tourniquet, such as a lower, lower extremity. Mm, it's, pretty well documented that it's going to, it's likely going to take two tourniquets to, to secure that properly. You can do that, but the concept of sending in an engine company with 50 tourniquets is um, broken for lack of a better word. Um, and this is, this is just active shooter. Um, at the end of the day, the fire department's major role, our biggest responsibility our most engaging task that we do is carry bodies to the colored tarps. We're not paramedics necessarily. We don't transport. We don't have ambulances unless you're that integrated department. And then you, you throw that whole concept out the window that I'm talking about. That's you literally carry bodies to the colored tarps. You are manpower. You're a mule. And I said mule, not jackass. You're a mule. You are a workhorse. You are, your function in life is to get the most injured people from point A to point B. That's it. That's your job. The rest of it is just super technical stuff. That's your job. Um, it's a proven, it was a proven fact in Aurora, Colorado, in Las Vegas, Patients were transported to the hospital from the incident site with zero medical interventions, zero. And they survived because what saved their life was access to definitive care, to surgery, to an OR. So the concept of, well, we have to, we have to treat and triage these, these, these people and that's, we provide that service. It doesn't matter if you provide that service. It's a statistically proven fact. It doesn't matter. Uh, show me a study that shows triage on 100 patients or more that was evaluated and proven to be effective. It, it doesn't exist. It hasn't been tested. Um, triage in an active shooter environment is not the same as we would do triage for a hurricane or a tornado. It's not the same as a triage for somebody who had been involved in a car accident, like a bus. Um, it's not the same. It's very different. People are running. Their heart rate is elevated. They've entered into an excited delirium state, and then they are injured. The shock to their body is different. The treatment is different. You've got to get them to an operating room. So that's, that's fire's function. The other thing, major thing that we bring to the table, incident command. Our ability our skill set, our experience with managing multiple resources. We provide that, that expertise. Lending that olive branch to law enforcement as being, hey, we're really good at this. That's the other, that's the other major function that we, can, that we can provide. And again, this is just active shooter. As you said, you throw fire into the mix, it changes the ball game. Um, you throw a hazardous material into the mix which we're going way back, anthrax, COBRA teams funded by DHS, 
um, you know, tracking through the JTTF, sending out bulletins of chlorine that was stolen or anhydrous ammonia from a, from a farm out in Montana and everybody be on the lookout. That's still a threat. Um, those things can be used. Explosives. It's, it's, there's a whole other, whole other can of worms that we haven't even begun to, to bre- to broach as a fire service by and large. We'll get there. There are departments that are doing it, um, but we're we're a few attacks away from being behind the eight ball again and trying to play catch up. So you are correct. The fire service we do bring incident command to the table, um, and the police recognize that because we use it every call, every day, twenty four seven. So when we talk about, you know, for chief officers that are listening, um, you know, we, we, we're going to set up a command post and there's probably going to end up being two command posts because, um, the police command post from what we were taught is they're not going to be rolling up on the scene. The command post may be a few blocks away. Um, because obviously if you have an active shooter situation, you don't want to be in a line of fire. Um, how do we, uh, insert ourselves, for lack of a better word, into their command post of, hey, um, when you have a moment, let's debrief. I'm going to let you know the resources that we have on the scene, our capabilities, and um, let's work together. Obviously, law enforcement side is yours. We'll support you in whatever way you need. But when we transition um, and we have to start pulling people out, you know, we're going to have to, you know, how, how can you help us type of thing? <clears throat> how would a battalion chief or an assistant chief, um, even a, a, on the career or volunteer side, uh, in, insert themselves in that command post to, and, and let figure out a way for the officers that are in that command post to understand what you, what you offer when it comes to the incident command world. Um, in the command post, after the tones have gone off and you've arrived on scene, it's too late to, it's too late to try to, to try to sell your, sell your service. Um, so ahead of time is, is, is the biggest, is the biggest thing to, to, to tackle. And for, for fire, again, this goes back to some simplicity. We got to, we got to kind of give the cops a break. So we like to say cops, they don't do incident command. Well, they do. They just don't call it the same thing that you do. And they don't have as many resources, be it manpower that they are expected to manage. So if a uh, vehicle pursuit, you get in a vehicle pursuit, vehicle crashes, or they stop. Doors fly open, people start running. That first officer begins a foot chase, follows whatever their radio procedures are to announce that, hey, clear the channel, I'm in a foot foot pursuit, gives a description of the person and the direction of travel. By NIMS, by ICS, that individual is command. Well, they're a working command. I can tell you as being some one of those people who's running, you ain't in command of shit. <laughs> what you're in, what you're in command of, or what what you're trying to be in command of, is your is your respiration rate, is your heart rate. That's that's what you're trying to be in command of, because at some point you're expected to talk on the radio, and you can't talk on radio like this when I've been running. So you're not you're not in command of anything. You're not. You're not managing anything. You're not giving direction to incoming resources. If you've watched five minutes of cops or live PD or live on patrol or any of those, those television programs, you have some officers that they can run like Carl Lewis and talk like we're sitting at the kitchen table. Congrats. You're awesome. You, you are the epitome of the professional athlete 
within the emergency services world. That is not, by and large, what reality is. They will give a direction of travel and a description. They will do everything in their power to either catch that person and or keep them in sight. You may get the occasional radio transmission when you're turning a corner, and it's literally it's literally a short communication. We're on, we're on Tyler Street. That's, that's what's communicated. It's the second doing officer, potentially the third doing officer, that arrives at your patrol vehicle, and then they start to secure the vehicle that you had, had pulled over, and they start communicating to the next arriving in units. I need a block at Figueroa and Flower. I need a block over here at North, North and Main. We'll set up a perimeter. K9 dispatch. Do I have a K9 officer in route? Copy. Yeah, you have K9 24. K9 24. What's your status? Um, you need to come to my location. Here's where the vehicle is, because they'll put the dog in the car to pick up the scent to then do the track. All of that stuff is going on. That is, that is command. That's you are managing resources. You are affecting the choreography of the dance. They are ridiculously skilled in it. As soon as you formalize it and you start placing labels and names on things, it's like we have this this mental lightning strike that prevents any common sense approach to, to dealing with the event. We did the, the NIMS 100 and 200, and where I understand the concept behind that computer-based education system or whatever, um, I don't think that really had the expected intent. Now, I didn't do the law enforcement portion. It wouldn't shock me all that much if there was, uh, you know, fire departments do this too. Oh, we have this training class? Oh, cool. Well, Bob's going to do it. He's going to get to the test. Bob's going to write the answers down. And the next time you come into shift, hey, you need to log on to the system, click next 67 times, get to the test, here are the answers. Or we went through that program, we learned those things, and then never applied them. And it's lost. So you say, yeah, well, I have NIMS 100 and 200, 700 and 800. Right. But you have like five, five commanders on an incident. And that's law enforcement does that. So you may have a tactical commander. You may have an incident commander. You may have a forward command. You may have um, a commander because that's their rank. Shift commander, it may be borough commander, zone commander, whatever. That word is used quite frequently within law enforcement's day-to-day. That gets confusing super fast. You could have a command, an incident command at the patrol level who is absolutely in command of the perimeter and everything outside the perimeter. The inner perimeter being SWAT, SRT, specialty team, they have a command. They have a tactical command. Tactical command within that little bubble, that circle, they are absolutely in charge. The incident commander, who's the zone sergeant standing out on the perimeter, that guy's in charge of who's blocking traffic and what other other necessary resources need to get in and out. That's about all that guy's in charge of. And you'll learn that the hard way when you go to a call out and you go up to the sergeant, the captain, the lieutenant, whoever looks crisp and clean and seems calm and standing at the back of an SUV or something like that or has a clipboard in their hand or some other type of paper with a radio and a pen that doesn't have their gun out. And you're like, ooh, this person's in command. And you'll have a deep formal discussion about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And then when the shit hits the fan, you're going to see somebody in cat gear with a headset is going to go, what are you doing? Oh, we're, we're, we're executing our, that ain't a plan. Get the hell out of here. They're like, what are you talking about? It's about, it's about understanding where that, that footprint goes. So if you can understand that the cops, they know how to do command. Understand that for the first 15 to 30 minutes, it's likely nobody's going to be in command. 
It's likely you're going to get everybody with a badge and gun and a radio that heard the call is going to descend upon that incident location until information is received that the threat is has been neutralized, which after the primary threat has been neutralized, there's always secondary or tertiary threats that likely don't exist but are reported to exist that we have to go snuff out. So we're going to stay in that tactical huff, 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 huff mode until we go and, and deal with that. That's what they're going to focus on. It's literally like being on a truck company and you're assigned to a roof and you're going to do a trench cut on this mythic commercial roof. Your life, everything about what you are doing is the saw and the cuts that you're making to do the trench cut. You have no concept of anything that is going on outside of that, that three to six foot span of awareness. It's why the company officer stays between the ladder and the crew that is working when you're on a commercial roof. Why? Because their span of awareness, their ability to view things from a distance is a safety measure in which to pull you off the roof. The cops, it's the same thing. If their gun is out, if the gun is out of the holster and you're either at the ready position or you have it pointed down, down range, you are at the task level. You have that saw. That is, that is where you are. Your ability to understand what's going on in the parking lot is nothing. Your ability to understand how many resources you have coming to you is nothing. Your ability to give instructions to follow on resources is nothing. It doesn't exist. That's why we have battalion chiefs. That's why we have company officers. They step back. We maintain the span of control. Law enforcement doesn't do that. They're used to operating in a vacuum of a singular singular entity. I'm going to solve my own problem. If I need help, I'll get mm, upwards to four or more officers that are going to come and help. But the exigency of the situation until the individual is in handcuffs on the day-to-day law enforcement response where they're calling for backup, it's exponentially shorter than what it is for us to put out a structured fire. Most, most interactions that require handcuffs are over in, in, in a couple of minutes or less. So you got to get, you got to get to that. Is that a huge long diatribe of, of, of ranting where you've probably taken notes and you want to go back and no, what I think what I think people need to understand <clears throat> when you're into these situations that it's not the uh, incident command system that we do when the building's on fire and how we're holding our span of control. I think that the incoming battalion chiefs, chief officers, uh, need to understand that while the law enforcement thing is happening in the middle of happening, we're obviously going to be staged in a safe zone if there's active shooting going on or whatever. Um, what I encourage people to do is to ensure that they have the police frequencies on their radios. Everybody has 800 radio systems. Now you may not have their tactical channels or their, they, uh, or they'll have, uh, encrypted channels. You may not have that, but you will have access to their dispatchers. Um, you will have access to hear what's going on. Is it escalating? Is it de-escalating? And I, and I think it's important that captains, lieutenants, battalion chiefs uh, monitor those radios while that uh, situation is happening. At the time that everything is um, under control, uh, threats have been neutralized, there's no secondary threats, that's where the incident command system will start to, and it depends on how much work needs to be done, if there's a lot of triage that has to be done or whatever, uh, is where the fire department will sort of insert themselves into the incident of, okay, here's the resources I have. They said they've got, you know, 15 injured people. I've got eight ambulances out here. Um, We can either start setting up our triage tarps we can do our triage treatment and transport we just start shoving people out like you said bring them out on the tarps we can start tri- triaging in there and then start sending them to the places that they need to be whatever hospitals they need to be that's where the fire department will start to inject themselves so i think i what people need to understand in the fire service is that 
you will be embedded with the police, but not to the point where you're in the car with them, you're running next to them, you're wearing your full tactical gear, you're going to have a weapon. That's not what is required when you are working with the police. You're there for twofold. You're there for if an officer goes down and immediately needs to be pulled out, treated and transported immediately, you're there with your unit. If you are a specialized department, your station or whatever is that specialized unit that works with the police. Um, Outside of that, you're there to start treating any victims that were part of that uh, active shooter situation or hostage situation or whatever it was. Um, Once that incident has de-escalated and things are secure, then they're going to bring you in and you start treating and transporting. It doesn't, it's, I can tell you, I've been on a handful of call outs. They take a long time. Um, and there's a whole lot of nothing going on for the fire department. Um, once you have a a, a patient, it's like any other patient, you're going to evaluate, you're going to figure out if they need to be transported. It's usually one or two people. They get transported. Police start cleaning everything up. Fire department goes home. Um, but you may be on the scene for four or five hours before you do that three minutes worth of work. Um, so it's, it's not sexy like the building fire. It's not, um, you're standing next to the police commander and you guys are sharing the radio and you're making calls and things like that. People need to understand in the fire service, that's not what it is. What it is, is that you're there for the safety of the officers and then for the safety of the civilians once everything's under control. Would that kind of sum it up? Would you, would you say? Um, yeah. And the thing is, is to identify what those roles are in advance. Um, law enforcement rescue team is, is a model in order to access and treat and care for victims. So in the Richland County Sheriff's Department, before <clears throat> um, this became popular and, and fire and EMS really started jumping into the integration, they trained the law enforcement personnel to identify red tag victims and literally would create a casualty collection point. So after they neutralized the shooter, they would have law enforcement would immediately start to identify regs and drag them to a central point. Um, virtually, if they could, they probably would have stacked them like cordwood. And it was part of their their method of being proactive. And so, so that, that could vary, but the broad scope of it, Exactly correct. Um, Now, there are people who are going to be listening to this who are who are likely going to say, because I I heard it in my head when you said it. Yes, there are departments that can monitor their law enforcement, but we can't. We're not allowed to. Our our, you know, PD channels are encrypted. Um, There's a loose loose guidance when it comes to NCIC, which is the, the database that law enforcement looks you up in to see if you have any wants, warrants. Um, there is loose guidance that's managed by the FBI in which they articulate that if you are, if you are not NCIC certified, if you have not had the training or the class, you ought not be exposed to NCIC information. And if the radio transmits NCIC information, so agencies that encrypt their radio channel, when you say, hey, I need your channels, well, you know, you're not authorized by NC- to have it under NCIC rules. Um, we could lose our NCIC certification. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> so um, you're communicating information over the radio is not the same thing as me being able to look up somebody's license plate, see their address, be able to understand their criminal history, association hits, social security numbers, PII stuff, things like that. That that's what the intent is. So might need to work around that. Um, Attempting to get your law enforcement radio channels is massively important. Uh, Massive. It barter, sign a blood oath that you won't use it inappropriately. You only transmit on that channel in the event of emergency. You leave it fenced to the battalion chief or the company officers. 
whatever the circumstances, you need the radio channel. Aurora is, a, is, is another great example. They are screaming on the radio for gas masks. They are screaming on the radio for EMS to get into Theater 9. And they are relying on a fire or on a police dispatcher to gather that information, type it in a computer, send it over to the fire and EMS dispatcher, or the fire dispatcher and the EMS dispatcher, who are all separate people, to get the information to you via the radio while the 911 phone continuously rings off the hook, your admin lines are ringing off the hook, you're getting other dispatches for emergency call-outs for other calls for service that they're managing. They literally just had a neutron bomb dropped into the middle of their dispatch center. You think we're having a bad day? Be in there where they're getting hundreds to thousands of calls within spans of, of, of an hour or two about this event and ancillary things, and they're trying to get that information to you. It's going to be delayed. It's going to be lost. It's going to be whatever have you. If you do not have that radio channel to hear that information, you're not going to get the information in a timely manner, and it's going to affect your operation. Yeah, we're fortunate in, uh, in Montgomery and in, in Frederick. Um, the police and fire dispatchers are in the same room. They literally can yell across the room to each other. Um, the police dispatchers were trained in taking calls on the fire side in Montgomery County. Um, <clears throat> and it's the same in Frederick. Uh, we have the capability uh, to monitor the dispatch channels. Um, only the battalion chiefs can uh, communicate with dispatch on the police side. Uh, on the fire side, uh, in the apparatus, they could monitor on their portables, but they couldn't key up. Um, and I, as a battalion chief, I only had to talk to police dispatch once. Um, it was they were uh, actively looking for somebody who just stole, assaulted somebody, and stole something from them, and they were running away. And uh, they were running towards uh, where I actually was. And uh, lo and behold, within three minutes, there's a guy running across the field that they're looking for. And they're heading off in a different direction. And I got on, and, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, Montgomery County Fire Rescue Battalion Chief, you know, 701 to communications. And go ahead. So the person you're looking for that just did this robbery uh, at this location is now on this street running this direction. They said, okay, a bunch of cars go by. So I know my message was heard. The only time I ever had to talk to police dispatch. Um, but we did monitor. So we did know what was going on. Um, with on the police side, um, believe it or not, we're an hour and twelve minutes into this conversation, which uh, which is fantastic. Um, it's a lot of good information. It's a lot of information that people need to digest. They need to build the relationships with their police departments. They need to if if they don't come to your firehouse, they don't park in your parking lots. Um, call the call the station. And just say, hey, can you have uh, whatever person's working in this particular area come by the firehouse? Uh, not an emergency. Just want them to stop by the firehouse real quick. They'll come by and just introduce yourself. Say, hey, you know, I'm Chief So-and-So, Captain So-and-So, whatever. Um, just wanted to uh, introduce myself. Uh, you know, we're out here running calls. Um, I want you guys to know that you have an open invitation to come into our department anytime. Uh, come in, sit down, have a cup of coffee, relax. You can use our restrooms. Um, do your reports, whatever. We, we have whatever you need. You build that relationship because there's going to be a time when you're going to need those guys um, and they're going to bust a gut to get out there and help you. Um, on the, on the, on the uh, lighter side, uh, there have been times where I may be going a little too fast, going to the firehouse to get the apparatus out, and uh, they, recognize no. your, they recognize your vehicles. I've been pulled over before. He comes up to my car, and he goes, you going to the firehouse? I said, yeah. He said, go, go, go. Sorry, I pulled you. He's apologizing, and he pulled me over because I was speeding. Um, but you build those relationships. Don't abuse those relationships, but, but you build them. Build that trust. Um, they're going to know that, hey, we as the fire department, we have your back as far as we can, um, and we know you have our back. And, and, and that's what it's all about. You know, we're all on the same team. Um, the police need to know that, you know, not everybody hates you. We are in your corner, and, uh, you know, we know that if we ever need, need you uh, in an emergent situation, you're going to be there for us. So... Like so we're at the uh, at the end of the podcast here, so I want to give you some part. I want you to have the chance to give some parting words, uh, Steve, uh, of uh, people that are out there that maybe 
contemplating, uh, you know, what role can they play in the police world? Uh, what do they have to offer, and how can we uh, make make this this uh, idea come to fruition? Well, you, you you covered the 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 relationship piece, and again, I I, w- I would emphasize handshake and a smile goes a long way. Um, in, invite people into your house and let them understand that it's also their house. And you may not agree with that. And the kindest way I can possibly say that, you, who gives a shit? It's you have to formulate the relationship and reach out the olive branch. And if you're law enforcement and you happen to be listening to this podcast, it's perfectly acceptable for you to stop by the fire station. Um, whenever you do that, exchange phone numbers. You, it, it's important. If you have a business card, pass the business card. Um, if you've ever been inside a, lo- a cop's car around the little dome light, you'll see driver's licenses that were confiscated and business cards. And if, if you get your business card put up in the dome light, it means you, you've hit the level of importance where I want to save your card exchanging that because you can do the pleasantries and the handshakes and all that other kind of stuff. And 10 minutes later, they may have forgotten your name as they get, as they get into stuff. So make sure that you, you leave a method for people to communicate with, with each other and follow up. If they don't follow up, you follow up, um, stick with it, stay the course, be resilient, say, we are going to have a relationship period, whether you like it or not. Um, we're, we're, we're going to do this. Um, if you've championed that and you got to that point, invite them out to, to observe your training. Seek opportunities for you to go to their training. Uh, when we started, started doing some integration stuff, the first thing, that, uh, first thing I push forward is chief officers. You're, you're going to start going to these law enforcement trainings when they're doing recertification for pepper spray and taser and all that. And it's like, well, why am I going to this? You just go and be present. That was my message. Go and be present. Well, in the end, it's what for. Over time, you're able to articulate that you understand what they are doing at the task level. You understand having observed the training with the goal being, let me manage the first 15 minutes of this dance. Is it possible for, if I have your radio channels, and I've built a relationship of trust, will you allow me to start moving pieces on the board to help facilitate the mitigation of this response? Um, If you have a flashover trainer, work it out so that SRT or SWAT or whoever can gear up in bunker gear and put them in a flashover trainer under the greatest auspice of safety and approvals and whatever it is you need to do, but put them through a flashover trainer, show them the development of fire transitioning over to flashover, take a water can in with you, show them what a water can can do. Once they understand that, you'll see that the SRT and the, and the SWAT teams will stop carrying ABC extinguishers to put out the fires that their flashbangs and tear gas grenades cause. And they'll switch to a water can because they'll, they'll have learned that that ABC is going to do nothing but obscure your vision even more than the smoke is currently obscuring it. Um, build, build upon that. Make sure that you have clear objectives and that each person's role is understood. And you can write your IEP out right now. You can get, a, you can get an ICS form and a pencil and write out your, IP, your IEP right now. It's... Stop the killing, stop the dying, rapidly transport, initiate recovery. There's your IEP. We're done. That's what it is. Do those, do those four things. Those, those four things are going to be your IEP no matter, where you, no matter what your incident happens to be, if there's a threat of death and it's integrated with law enforcement. That, that's your IEP. Save it. Put it in the clipboard. You're good to go. You're all set. Um, you, need to, you need to train together as much as you possibly can. If you can do tabletops, it doesn't have to necessarily be face-to-face. Sit at your desk with your radio. 
um, run a tabletop. The, the idea being law enforcement is going to descend upon that location with a force that will blow your mind. They're going to do that. You're going to have problems with traffic. You're going to have problems with law enforcement vehicles parked in your way. You're going to want to call the next three to four tow trucks on rotation to be able to hook cars and move them. You're going to look to use law enforcement vehicles as vehicles of opportunity to transport patients after you've run out of ambulances because you're going to run out of ambulances. You, you have to have all those plans in place. You have to drill that. You have to discuss it. If you have nothing of what we've talked about on paper, even if you've trained it, if you have no policies, procedures, if you have nothing on paper, you, you, you ought to get to writing. Um, that's the foundation of your training. It, it's, it's mythically important. Um, when the Boston Marathon bombing occurred, they had law enforcement officers officers spontaneously respond from Vermont and New Hampshire. They weren't called. They weren't asked to assist. They arrived. And that's, that's a reality. There's going to be a management of that. We haven't even gotten into the federal alphabet soup of acronymed agencies that are going to show up to your event. It's when you learn that the postal inspector is actually a federal law enforcement officer and has a badge and a gun. When he shows up at your active shooter scene, true story happened. Um, so that th- those things need to be discussed. Offer up your skill set. Offer up your ability to manage the dance, moving pieces on the board, and doing that incident command piece. And articulate and recognize, I am not in charge of nothing. We are the fire department. Our role here is to move bodies to the colored tarps, patients from A to B. A little bit deeper, but that's the concept. I'm not here for anything more than that, but I'll aid you in command. Let me know what you need and know that an active shooter, you're going to have multiple operational periods that are going to far exceed the first two or three hours that your people are going to be doing a bulk of the work. Sandy Hook had three weeks, refrigeration trucks, putting bodies in refrigeration trucks, and it took three weeks to maintain that scene. And that's going to require an incident command element. Um, it's, it's a big deal. It's important. So pour into this. Um, pour into it greatly. And if you figured it all out, cool. Start pouring into fire as a weapon. Start pouring into IEDs. Start pouring into vehicle as a weapon. Protests, riots, civil unrest, all that stuff. Because our dynamic is, is quickly changing. And it's going to get worse before it gets better, I promise you well unfortunately we're gonna we're gonna end on on the depressing note but the good thing is is that uh you know the fire service is resilient uh as is the police department and there's a place for us to be working together steve i want to pre- i appreciate you coming on the show and just kind of giving a different uh shed a different light on what we normally talk about on here i think it's uh extremely important that uh, we do engage with the law enforcement partners to make sure that uh, we're working together. So we're working together for the same goal and just to make sure that uh, that everything runs smooth. So I appreciate you being on the show. And um, with that, uh, have a good evening. Well, and I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'll invite you onto my show. Scenes of violence on the fire engineering uh, blog talk radio. We'll uh, we'll pick up the conversation and hopefully we can do this again. Sounds expand great. And on some all kinds of other things that we didn't cover. Absolutely, sounds great. Well, Steve, thanks for being on the show, and then uh, uh, I'm sure we will talk long before FDIC. Uh, and if everybody everybody out there, um, if you need to get uh, if you want to get a hold of Steve or you have some information, Steve, if you want to put some of your uh, uh, a way that they can contact you. Also, you can talk a little bit about your uh, the DVD, which is uh, available through Pinwell. Um, but if you want to put uh, any email out there, if anybody has any questions, or I can just link that to the show. Yeah, I'm at uh, CAPT or Captain Hamilton22 at Twitter. I think it's the same as Instagram. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, you can hit me up on my on my email at hammy91 
H A M Y nine one at yahoo.com. Uh, hit me up if you've got questions or, or you want to chew the fat a little bit. Um, yes, my DVD is, is through fire engineering books and videos. It's going to be short lived. They are going away from their DVD platform, but it is on fire engineering books and videos streaming site. Um, and I have a couple of, of videos on the fire Academy. Also, also a fire engineering platform. Um, we're looking to expand that a little bit. So, um, yeah, if you, if there's something I can do for you, if I help you with policy writing, you want me to come in and teach a class, you, some consulting, just reach out, shoot me an email and, and we'll work it out. And, and I'm, I am in deep gratitude to you, Mr. Vice President, for having me on your show. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, until next month, guys, thanks for listening. Steve, thanks for being on the show, and uh, catch up with you later. Have a good evening. You too.